Hey all, welcome to this week's Unreal Engine News and Community Spotlight. Recently, we announced the launch of our Unreal Authorized Training Partner Program. The demand for Unreal Engine skills is projected to grow 119% over the next 10 years, so it's the perfect time to connect with skilled trainers and training centers to share their knowledge and help educate professionals around the globe. Partners in the program will gain access to training curriculum, unique branding, and be invited to the annual UATC Summit. For more about the benefits, eligibility, and application process, read our program overview. For 3D Arena fighting game Jump Force, which infuses megastars from Dragon Ball, Naruto, One Piece, My Hero Academia, and more, developer Spike Chunsoft spent considerable time making sure that characters' movesets felt true to their source material while also creating a balanced, competitive roster. If this weren't challenging enough, the Japanese developer also went the extra mile to create a compelling narrative that ties all of these disparate universes together. Speaking to how the studio is able to accomplish this world colliding task, we caught up with producer Koji Nakajima for a quick chat about the project. While Jump Force was released earlier this year, the producer elaborates on how the studio is still releasing new content for the game and is taking an active approach, working with the game's community, to continually improve Jump Force over time. NVIDIA has wrapped up their DXR Spotlight contest, an event celebrating amazing ray trace content from Unreal developers. Each of the contest's three finalists showed off the tech in a variety of really fun ways. Congrats to Christian Hecht with Attack from Outer Space, which recreates the look of classic 50s sci-fi films, Alden Fillion for Diode, where one plays as a futuristic knight battling the forces of evil, and to Opus Visual for LP Trailer, in which you can drive a big rig around a truck yard. Nice work, everyone. For those of you looking for the latest and greatest, Unreal Engine 423 Preview 5 is now available for download. Have fun and take our newest features for a test run. As always, we appreciate any feedback you may have on these builds, but do keep in mind they are not production ready, so make copies of your projects for now. Check out the full list of fixes and changes on the previews forum thread. And on to our weekly Karma earners, we're giving a big shout out to Clockwork Ocean, Shadow River, Thompson N13, Jez Central, Zia, 6R0M, T Sumisaki, Barrio Dole, Cosmic Lobster, and Firefly74. Thank you so much for helping out folks over on Answer Hub. You all are absolutely wonderful. An atmospheric first-person puzzle adventure, Hourglass, is our first spotlight of the week. Discover Egyptian technologies, solve challenging puzzles by manipulating time, and explore an ancient world. Really, really great work by this fantastic team of only two. Next up is Trails of the Black Sun, a first-person shooter and platformer hybrid. Set in a digital simulation, the Ancient Order of the Black Sun sends you, an initiate, to find hidden artifacts and face the Templars. And we're wrapping up with You Don't Have Time. This first-person puzzle game takes you on a journey through a sci-fi labyrinth filled with puzzles. Will you have time to solve them one by one to discover the reason of your presence? Guess you'll have to play to find out. Thanks for joining us for this week's News and Community Spotlight. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Unreal Engine Livestream. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and here with me today, we have Senior Developer Relations Tech Artist, Alan Willard. It is a lot of title. Yes. No. When, when you're at a company for long enough, they just start tacking extra words on. Okay, to make sure to, that... To, to, just to keep you feeling important. I yeah. see, I see. And to make other people know that, like, oh, wow, there's... Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's like this, you know, abstracted title. It's just created to impress people. No, so, it actually does mean... So things. what does a senior developer relations tech artist do at Epic? So I am kind of a firefighter, uh, kind of along the jack of all trades route. Um, I know a bunch of different parts of the engine, and I use that um, for various projects to help out. Um, I also do a lot of traveling. So I go to trade shows, I go to licensees, mm -hmm. uh, other studios, and help get them up to speed on the engine as well, as well as doing things like this and special project stuff. Like I said, it's kind of a master of all trades, jack of none, or jack of all trades, master of none. Thing. Sounds pretty fun. It can be. It can also be a little stressful. There can be a lot of demands uh, immediate because you do end up on things that don't have a whole lot of uh, time left on them. Mm -hmm. You know, projects where something is 
you know, due in a few weeks, so it can be a little more stressful. But it's also a lot of fun to take on new challenges, right. you know, learn new things about the engine because oh, you know, I haven't ever worked on this part, and now I have something I have to fix. So it can it can be thrilling and challenging at the same time. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and today we're here to show off a little bit of a touch input, something you've been working on, right? Yeah, so one of those, well, a multitude of those projects that I was talking about have been for trade shows or demonstrations where we wanted to have a touch screen that people could come up and interact with that showed off something in the world. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's our digital humans with the Andy Circus and, and, and the other character heads or some of our things like human race where you have a configurator. You have a menu, you can change options on the car and look around the car. Um, a few years ago we had one and I instead of just building it as a one-off, I kind of built it as an abstract thing. So I can drop it into different projects and get some of the basic functionality right off the bat. And that's how you generally, it's nice to design your you know, your implementation of whatever it might be in, in such a way that like, oh, I can use this later. Exactly. You know? um, it was one of those things because we knew we had a couple projects coming up when I started the first one that we're going to use the same kind of, mm -hmm. you know, touch interface. So um, I built it to work the first time and then I spent a little bit of time kind of pulling back on it being specific to that project and, and making it more abstract. And now I can pretty much just dump it into uh, a new project get a really basic set of interaction controls, and then tailor it to whatever the needs of that project are. Yeah. So before we get started mm -hmm. with your presentation, I do want to know, let everyone know that we will be announcing the theme of the Summer U4 Jam. Um, roughly about an hour. We'll see when Al's presentation here is going to come to an end. But with that said, um, let's get started. Sure. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the uh, project. I've already got it here on the touch screen. So as you can see, I've got... Uh, just the VR scene because it had a couple of interesting objects. Uh, I've already put in my uh, necessary components. So there's two things. There's a touch manager, which doesn't actually have much of a visual representation in the world. Um, and that's the object that actually handles input and then hands it over to my orbit blueprint, which is here. And the orbit blueprint has a little more graphical interface going for it. Um, so the red ring that goes around shows you the actual limits of the camera, so how far around the object you can turn. Uh, and then there's a blue arc here. If I deselect it, you can see it a little better. That actually shows how far up the camera will be, will be able to pitch while looking at that center point. So before I get into the specifics of it, I'll go ahead and actually run it. Uh, go full screen. So now I'm literally touching to control. I've got simple swipe controls. I can also pinch to zoom in and out, which also gives me tracking. So I can pan around the object, continue to rotate, zoom in. And all of this is being done just with a couple of fingers. So I'll jump back into the actual tools and I'll open up that touch manager first. So the touch manager, it's not terribly complicated. It just does a lot of um, stuff that gets passed over to the cameras. Um, the first thing it does is it actually manages all of that touch input. So when I touch the screen, this event is going to fire based on what's going on. If I just touch and release, if I actually swipe, it knows that if I have multiple touches, it's going to enumerate those. So one, two, three, as I put more fingers on the screen. And it also knows where each of those are. So if it's all enabled, it actually sits here and just handles all of the touch, looks to see how many touches are happening, passes that on. Um, and then it starts storing all these touch locations. And that's where the, the, the more complicated stuff starts to come in. We start looking at where did the first finger touch, where did the second finger touch, looking at differences between those and all of that filtering then starts to give you, here's vectors on the screen for where you're touching, where you're moving your fingers. And we can also handle mouse input as well. So if I just hit play and use click and drag the mouse, I get the same input controls. Nice. Because as far as the input is concerned, I'm passing in that something changed. Mm -hmm. If it's mouse X and Y or if it's finger X and Y on the screen, I can basically keep those the same and have everything working simultaneously. So this is just touch. This is click and drag with mouse. Except I lost focus. So here's click and drag with mouse. Here's touch. And all of that just works right off the bat. 
So inside of our touch manager, we've got a couple of different graphs. So for example, my pinch results. It's a little more complicated. Again, what we're doing is basically looking to see, have you touched it, which fingers, and where did those fingers touch? And then we start looking at, has that changed since the last time we checked? So I've touched and moved, is that greater or less than the last time? And then we start figuring out where we're going to touch, where we're going to swipe, and interpolate those values together. So again, there's quite a lot of math that kind of gets bled together um, to filter it. Because when you first touch, if you just look at the raw data that comes in, it's very noisy. The touch screen knows that your finger's moving, but your actual finger, as pressure changes, as you know, just normal variation mm -hmm. in human movement, we want to smooth a lot of that out. So it fluctuates quite a bit, it the does. raw data. And, yeah. and different devices can d give a different amount of fluctuation. Okay. So the filtering can get pretty important, especially when you're talking about you know, a 75-inch screen that you're, yeah. you're touching on and swiping. So a lot of that stuff is, is built in, and there's uh, values in here for adjusting the amount of touch you get. Mm -hmm. So if suddenly you're really sensitive on one project, there's places where you can easily just dial back that sensitivity. So once we've generated all of this math and, and are doing all of our filtering where we're averaging things together, um, we pass those into a couple of variables. The, the most common one is just touch X and Y. And those get passed into our orbit blueprint, which looks like this. So here's that same layout, not that you can see it all that well in this background, but we have that red ring and the blue arc showing our camera layout. And a lot of this is set here in this hierarchy. Essentially, each one of those, these scene uh, components is just giving me another point of abstraction. So if I only want to rotate this, I can rotate that one piece, and all the other stuff will inherit that. Okay. So I, it's essentially setting up a large, complicated gimbal for mm -hmm. the camera. The camera can swing this way. It knows it can swing this way. If I just adjust this one piece, I can move the camera in and out without losing the rest of my tracking perspective. And I realize it's on the scene, but I'm talking with my hands and all sorts of stuff. Um, so once I had all this set up, it became pretty easy to say, if I only want to rotate around the orbit, that's going to take my camera and all the other pieces. If I only want to rotate around pitch, that's going to give me those controls and so on and so forth. And then in the event graph, we're going to get a little more complicated here again. So every tick, we look to see whether or not things are happening. Um, we also have things that are built in for fading, because again, like I said, this was used for a number of different projects. So there's portions of those projects kind of still in there. Um, so on Begin Play, we actually set up a timer. Um, one of the first things that we wanted was if nobody comes up and touches it, we want the camera to kind of ease back to the default setting. Okay. So we store um, that default location when you first start the project or game or, or map, uh, and then that becomes the reset point. So wherever the, the, the designer authors it to look, that's where the camera is going to nice and gently ease back to if nobody touches it for whatever the, the initial timer is. Um, and then we go through and we set up all of the arcs so that they work. Um, and then here, I'll go do this in the event graph, we can start to look at some of the um, ways that we're applying these values. So when I pinch, what actually happens is I look at where your two fingers touched, and then I compare, have they gotten closer or further together? Basically, I just look to see if the vector between those two points is getting longer or shorter. That gets passed through as my pinch input and filtered. And then I can use that to start smoothly adjusting the zoom based on the max and min values. So as you pinch, I can say I can only go in 10%. doesn't matter how far yeah. you pinch. I know that I don't want the camera going beyond a certain point, either because you'll clip through something mm -hmm. or it might go out of depth of field or something like that. So that gives you those controls. Uh, and then we literally just begin interpolating it back to zero if your timer is over. And then we set that as the final value, and then that gets passed. And here's where the zoom actually happens. So we set the pinch as the value 
that we're going to zoom in, basically how many units am I going to zoom in and mm -hmm. out, is driven all by that percentage of how close or far have my fingers gotten. And that same kind of uh, behavior is used to do things like setting the pitch of the camera, setting the yaw of the camera. We take these touch inputs, and you can see there's mouse or touch, and that's how I make sure that everything works in parallel. Mm -hmm. If the mouse is moving or the touch, it just looks at those as the same kind of input and just filters them down. Uh, and then, again, we have that sensitivity value. Yeah. So I can say, you know, like this display, I'm getting tons of return off a of very small input. Let's dial that back or increase it if it just feels sluggish and slow. Um, and then, yeah, it starts getting filtered in. There's ranges to make sure everything's clamped. You don't get wild values going off all over the place. Uh, and then this is going to interpolate. Um, again, well, we basically are always trying to bring values back to zero. Mm -hmm. it's like you, you t touch very strikingly. We don't want the camera to do this. We want it to kind of ease back down. So I've got values in there that let me adjust that as well. Uh, and then we have things that uh, look to see what your limits are, mm -hmm. and I'll show that in a minute so that we can decide whether or not we're going to use the limits uh, that I've set up. So now that you've seen a little bit of the interior, I'll show you some of the setup for the actual object. So here's my orbit blueprint, and here's some of those settings that I've created for it. So we have our default zoom in and out, and that sets, that's actually the number of units that the camera itself is going to move. Okay. Rather than adjusting the FOV, Actually moving the camera in is a lot easier from this standpoint because it means you can change out the camera mm -hmm. and you'll still get the same amount of travel. You don't have to worry about your lens length being different or the aperture changing or anything like that. Um, here's the idle timer and attract timers and th that's what controls like if you haven't touched it for a while and you want it to ease back, that's mm -hmm. idle. If you want it to go into like the cinematic or something like that, that's what we call an attract mode. Okay. Nobody's touched it in like a minute or three minutes or something and we want it to do something kind of eye-catching to mm -hmm. come back. Uh, and then we have the camera angles themselves and I'm going to lock this so I don't have to have the uh, picture in picture up. And if I tell it to limit the orbit, you immediately see that it cuts that arc in half. And if I play it, I can't move past that point now with the mouse or the touch controls. So all of this is to give me an artistic idea of how my interface is going to work once I get into my project. Get back into my orbit blueprint here, lock it again. So we also have my min and max orbit arc. So as I change that value, and it's non-uniform, so I can say it can only go to the right. And now when I start it, I can go a little bit to the left because it's a value of like 5. But to the right, I can still go 90 degrees. So this gives you a lot of control over how your camera is going to fit into mm -hmm. your scene. And make sure that... If you're doing it live or something else, it won't go into a shot that you don't exactly. want. Exactly. There have been a couple, like at SIGGRAPH, we, we had uh, a demonstration using uh, Bianca, the ray tracing mm -hmm. content that um, we basically had pre-authored camera locations. And in one of them, when you went around, you would end up in literally in the weeds, the bushes around uh -huh. the lake. So that was a great fix, was just limiting the arc just short of that because I could see where everything was going to happen. Uh, in addition to being able to limit the arc, you can also choose a shift distance. And what this does is, um, with some of the car demonstrations that we did, you wanted kind of a, an overview when you looked down at it. You didn't want to just kind of look down into the car. So the shift overview gives you this. Oh, okay. So as I look down, I can actually draw the camera back to get a wider angle for that. And so that, those values are exposed, so you can say that what the shift distance is. So I'll set it to be some ridiculous value, and you can see it tries to approximate or tries to accomplish my goal based on the settings I gave it. So like I said, there's controls for uh, sensitivity, uh, and things like that. So drifting here, we wanted the feeling that when you touch the screen, oh, turn off the uh, debug arcs there. We wanted the feeling that when you touch the screen, there was a weight to it. Like when you let go, it would continue briefly, mm -hmm. almost like you were rotating a heavy sphere. 
right? When you let go, the inertia takes it a little farther and then it comes to rest. Um, and then we wanted a very small amount of permanent drift so that whatever the last direction you went, it would just keep the scene dynamic. So this allows you to have that slow weight to it that drags on. You can turn that off and you can pretty immediately see the difference. It'll just come completely to rest and stop instead of keeping that slow momentum mm -hmm. going. We can also get rid of all of the uh, averaging, the filtering that's being done, and use direct rotation, which is extremely responsive. But again, because it does get rid of some of the filtering, you can see it's extremely precise and just a little jittery. But this actually works really well with uh, mouse control. So here I have very precise, accurate control of where the camera is in relation to that orbit. Uh, with the mouse, so it, because the mouse has there's filtering that happens on mouse input already. Mm -hmm. um, you're actually you actually end up over filtering a bit um, if you're using mouse input in conjunction with the touch manager that I wrote. Um, but this lets you kind of back off on that if you know that you're going to be primarily mouse driven. And then tracking, um, we had for one of our the the human race demo. Uh, at the trade show that we built it for, we had a, a mo mobile phone that was hooked up where you could actually control the camera remotely. So this is allowing that input to drive the okay. position of the camera. And because I don't have any of that and hardware set up. And I saw a motion controller in there mm -hmm. as well. Yep. So there's actually one of the components in the hierarchy is the point at which the motion controller would disconnect those and let you take over from that point. So it still lets you set like where the camera is and the rotation. Mm -hmm. It just gives you free motion from that point. Okay. So we didn't end up suddenly like inside the car with the, the phone or the, the screen. Plus, because you could pick it up at any point, it needed to kind of cleanly pick up from where the camera was and be able to go back to it. So we had a button that would let you kind of uh, reset your, your position back mm -hmm. to the orbit blueprint. So it was always kind of safely authored. And then, again, we have the... Um, uh, more sensitivity, so this will let you control, uh, if I set the pinch sensitivity to 5, it's going to be very, very sensitive to me pinching in. If I set it to 0 0.01, it's extremely slow to respond to me pinching. It's doing it, but it's doing it so damped that uh, you don't really get a sense for it. So this also... Uh, comes in very handy in that at any point these values are editable. So, uh, for example, the Bianca scene that we had for mm -hmm. SIGGRAPH, um, because there were multiple camera angles, each one of those had different limits that needed to be applied. So we literally just had a struct that says, oh, you're going into camera shot three. Here's all the values that the, cam that the orbit blueprint needs to know about. So setting near and far limits, adjusting uh, uh, sensitivities and damping, per shot worked really well because all of these values are just exposed to blueprints. Anytime I want, I can just tell it, oh, by the way, here's your new limits, uh -huh. and it just works. And then in addition, we also have the tracking limit, which is how far the camera was allowed to leave when you're panning around. So if I set this to be 800 instead of 80, I can now move the camera way further when I'm pinching and dragging because I've given it a much more excessive limit. So again, depending on what you're kind of focused on and what you're trying to do, this can give you quite a lot of control over how your camera is going to view, view your scene. Now, the way um, in this particular um, example, on begin play, I'm just setting the, getting the player controller and setting the view to be my orbit blueprint. Okay. But you can do that at any point, right? You can cut to and away from it. You can mm -hmm. treat it just like you would normal camera um, because it does literally just have a normal camera component inside of it, well, cinematic camera component. Um, so if you wanted to change that out for your own, you could just go into the orbit blueprint and swap out that component and you can have a custom camera component blueprint if you wanted or anything else and then just cut to it and away from it. And that way you could say if you had a sequence in your game, mm -hmm. you could actually give player the freedom to orbit the cinematic camera. Exactly, yeah. Uh, if, you're t if you're basically viewing from it, 
the input at that time would be driving the position. Sequencer would still be controlling the motion of everything mm -hmm. else in, in your world. Your cinematic would continue to play, but your player would have some swing arm control over what they're looking That'd at. That'd be really cool, actually. I would, yeah. I would enjoy it, that. It should work right out of the box. Yeah. There's no reason it wouldn't. Um, so, and then we've also got, there's a couple of things that are built in that were used for special projects. Uh, one of them is a fade sphere. So we didn't have a post process that we wanted to dim in a certain way. Um, so what I did was there's literally in the, the blueprint, the uh, fade sphere component, it's a literal ball in the center that actually gets teleported to the camera's position right over the view and then we change the opacity. So it's literally just a lens that gets dark in front of your, your eyes and then we can fade it out. So you can have fade control as you change positions or if you're cutting from like one uh, uh, camera to another. Mm -hmm. uh, we use that for the uh, Andy Circus, the digital humans uh, content that we did. So that as, you, as we switched in the UI from one character to another, we just fade nicely down and not worry about the levels themselves knowing what the fade state was. The camera took care of all of it. And then we also have a teleport point so that we can uh, move the camera back if we need to. Um, and this is basically just if I want to attach something to camera, this is the component that I've, I've, I, I know will always be right in front of the camera, regardless of what the camera component is. So. And that's the, the basic controls. When you start getting into it, you'll notice that there are um, a lot of subgraphs for handling different things. Uh, determining the camera distance is literally just how far am I when I look up. It looks at the percentage that you're looking down towards the top of the pitch arc and that g gives you your linear scale. I found that it's actually easier in most cases to move everything but the camera and just have the camera attached to something. And that way if you ever need to do something in the camera space, the camera's local space is zeroed out. Uh -huh. it's, it's on a component that is receiving most of the input. And then when you need to move the camera in or out for a zoom, it's really easy to just move along that normal instead of having to retransform mm -hmm. where the camera is to some arbitrary space. Yeah, that um, parent-child hierarchy can, or the way that you organize that, can help you out with the logic itself. Oh yeah, quite often. Especially. Yeah, and um, for something that, like this, you don't you don't have to think much about oh, I, I can't have too many scene scene components, but because you know it has a little bit of overhead. Right. For something like this, it doesn't matter. Just no. implement it the way that makes it easier for you to think about. And yeah, generally speaking, when, when using something like this, our our scene is fairly centralized, mm -hmm. right? We have something. It may be a complicated scene to render, like the the human race. We had the 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 car on a rocky outcrop with you know a full scene, you know, world and sky and all that. Um, but when it comes down to it, everything you're focusing on is right there in the center. Mm -hmm. So you're you're balancing all of your performance, all of your your input controls on this kind of centralized idea. Um, so it becomes pretty easy to lay out a hierarchy like this, where you know the center is the important point. Everything is floating around that. All of your input, all of your control is going to go into cleanly and effectively moving around that center point. Um, so that makes it very easy. Um, and then. For some of the, the, the de demonstrations that we've done, um, we wanted to have this concept of touch interaction where you touch something on the screen and this system knows about it and handles it through. Now, not all of that is completely invoked, um, but there is a, inside the touch manager, it understands that you might not be swiping, that you might be touching something. Okay. And then it has an, the, um, an array of touch interaction points that are just, it harvests from the world. You drop them in, it understands what to do with them, and then when you touch it, we can move the camera to that point briefly. So if you have, say, I want to zoom on that, and I touch that thing, and it zooms in, okay. as long as there, it's understood to be a touch interaction point, I can just tell the camera to go to it, and then come back, and the camera will store its prior position so you don't accidentally end up going like through the object on uh -huh. the other side. So a lot of that stuff was, was set up so that we could try different things. Like it, very, very little of it was used in some of the final projects, but it was an important part of the iterative design process of being able to go, hey, what if the camera was over here? What if it was over here? Let's move it in or out. So the touch interaction stuff that's built in there uh, came in very handy with that.
Yeah, and that's just using the uh, on. I don't remember the name of that event, but there is an actual built-in event for when you when you tap. A, yes, a portion there, of there's the there's an on touch. This was more um, it not only passing that through, but also understanding um, which the, that it was time to suspend like the swipe input and things like that, so that we could cleanly go in into and out of it. it as as an anecdote, when I first put in the touch interaction stuff. Mm -hmm. You'd touch it, the camera would go there, and then you'd look around, and invisibly, the, all of the camera hierarchy was doing this while you were looking here, because I wasn't suspending touch input to that, because okay. I wasn't passing the data back and forth, at least not the correct way. Once I realized, because you, you know, it looks fine, you'd go out, and the camera would go backwards through the object and, and look at the wrong thing, I realized that it was going to become important that the system knows that you're in and out, mm -hmm. not just that you've interpolated the view to another camera and then you're trying to return back. I saw something else in the project that was actually new to me. You had two of the touch input events, mm -hmm. one inside the event graph and then yep. another one inside. I didn't actually know you could uh, you could have so them, use it, them in tandem like that. It passes the, the data back and forth. You're probably not supposed to do it that way. Okay. Um, I found that if I had more than two, I think it was more than two input touch events that it would start to complain on compile. Also, occasionally it would just complain on compile and I would like literally move another and it would just work. Okay. So I, th I have a feeling I'm utilizing something that's not intended to work quite as the way, but it's shipped on like six projects now and, and does actually do what I need it to do. So yeah, there are a couple places where, um, actually it's probably in touch manager. Yeah, I think it's saw there. So another way to do it would be to sort of expose all of that information into um, another set of data and then reuse that yeah, when you exactly. need it. Yeah, exactly. So for one thing, um, later on, I, I changed how we were suspending the attract mode. Because mm -hmm. every time you touch it, I basically say, well, the, the timer that was counting down gets invalidated, set back to five seconds or 15 seconds or whatever. But that meant that everywhere that something was happening, the touch was involved, it needed to know to invalidate that timer. So what we did instead was creating an event dispatcher called touch happen. And then every time the touch manager detects any kind of touch, it doesn't matter if it, if it cares about it or if it's a swipe or, or just uh, a gesture, a pinch, whatever, it also happens to fire off this dispatcher. And then anything that needs to know about it can just go, oh, a touch happened, I need to mm -hmm. invalidate my own timer internally. So it made it much easier to broadcast that out and then just have things understand that I don't have to have a touch input event in me because I'm being informed by this other thing that's kind of the master interaction point for all of that. That yes, touch happened and I don't need to do whatever it is until then. So that was kind of an important part of getting it to work right. Mm -hmm. was, was, you know, you swipe and you swipe and everything looks great and then suddenly it takes the camera control away because some other blueprint went, oh, it's time for our attract mode to kick on. Centralizing that into the touch manager made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. it, it, you kind of have this conceptual idea of touch manager is where all the raw data comes in, and then it filters it and passes it out to anything that needs it. It could be the orbit blueprint. I could write, there, there's actually a track pan uh, blueprint that doesn't do the orbit as well, but it still takes the same input from the touch manager. It just utilizes that differently once it's inside. So the idea being that you have this kind of hierarchical class set up of, I have one thing that understands the touch, and then I have a bunch of other things that can use that knowledge to do whatever. And it also helps you future-proof in case you have now new other things that you want oh, to listen for this event. So. You don't have to go back and add another reference to what exactly. you, you want to call it. Right. I just say, okay, and by the way, I also need to handle this yeah. touch happen to invalidate everything and just move on. So it, it, it's come in very handy. It's let us get a number of... Um, projects at least to the point where we could you know block out what the thing was going to look like mm -hmm. and, and get an idea of, of how we wanted the camera to interact without having to reinvent the wheel every time. right so it's come in really handy for that it's probably saved me man months of time being able to literally just open the old project migrate these two blueprints uh -huh. over they grab a couple of other assets they need which which is in this project and then because nothing in the Orbit Blueprint, nothing in the Touch Manager is uh, specific to that project, they just work, right? You yeah. have a camera, when I touch, it orbits around, and then you move on. 
Um, there are some caveats to that. Um, because this isn't done as like part of the input stack, it just kind of sits to the side of it and listens. Mm -hmm. um, there are things like UMG inputs, like you're, you're touching a UMG, it, it will hear that. So um, there, you can find in there there's exclusion zones. Uh, we basically, the last demo, the one for SIGGRAPH that we did, we knew the menu was this size in this corner. The When the UI creates itself, it fires an event that tells this what that those extents are, and then that builds the exclusion zone. So if the menu's open and I mouse over or, or touch over, all the camera work stops. It, it basically says, you're in that area where I can't pass the data along. Mm -hmm. So until I detect that touch coming out, I'm just disabling myself. So it makes it easy to have a simple UI mm -hmm. that, that gets rejected, but as soon as you have a couple panels, it gets a little more complicated. So it's definitely not meant to be a, here's my production game, here's my camera control for that production game, and everything just works. It's definitely more of a um, hand-built um, iterative tool that, mm -hmm. that helps a lot for kind of non-immediate gameplay uh, presentations. And the way that you're enabling listening for those inputs, that's just using the uh, enable input function yeah. and referencing yeah, the player controller, the, right? The blueprint for the touch manager is already set up to listen mm -hmm. to the input stack, and then um, I, I just have it not consume. So it doesn't become the final say on, like, oh, you touch the screen and nothing else can read that. Um, partly because we did have other uh, demos that where we didn't just want touch to control input, we wanted touch to do, you know, a particle system and things like that, where okay. you didn't want to um, have one thing be the only thing that yeah. knew about the, the touch input. Plus, you run into issues with, like, UMG, where I'm touching and it's consuming it, and so UMG doesn't see that I'm trying to touch the buttons. It just made it a lot easier. That's really neat. Yeah. I I, I've enjoyed it. It is. It has saved my my life in terms of time management on multiple occasions. Now, I've been really, really happy with how well this has uh, come out. Um, and you know, there's there's some um, that you can actually see in the Orb Blueprint. Like a lot of this stuff has been set up, but not quite uh, organized as well as the other. So. That'll be an ongoing part is, you know, for every project you find, oh, there's this other special case I need to deal with, or, oh, I've just come up with a better way of authoring mm -hmm. this. So you start kind of gutting small pieces and iterating on your design, not just how it works in the world, and so I need to go through and clean some stuff up. But. <laughs> and you did mention that after you've done that, you were willing to share yeah, uh, absolutely. the project? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just need to go through and make sure there's nothing project-specific left in there right. at all. But then, yeah, th there's absolutely no reason not to... To release this and a good way wants. to do that, if you don't know, is to use the migrate tool, and then you mm -hmm. can see all the references yep. that are being... And, and that's exactly how I got it into this empty mm -hmm. project, was I literally took the last project, the one from SIGGRAPH, and migrated it into a no, new 422.3, and it worked perfectly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and literally it made, um, if I pull up the content browser, the camera folder, that's it. That's everything that came in. So it's a couple of materials for like handling the arc, uh, a couple of um, blueprints, like you can see there's one for the touch interaction point which the touch manager can work with. Um, there's some curves for um, non-linearly pinching. I found that if you do a linear pinch, it feels way too abrupt. You want a little bit of an ease in, ease out. Okay. So when you pinch and touch, we can look up into the curve and see like, you know, zero to one actually ends up being like this instead of linear. So there's a couple of like kind of helper things in there as well. Yeah, I've started using curves a lot more. Yeah, they come in really handy once you realize that you can do something and just swap out the curves. Yeah. Right? It's like, I, yeah, that doesn't feel right. I don't have to edit the curve. I can just have three or four duplicates that are pre-edited and then swap them out. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, the, the concept of per camera shot having a struct that kind of gets sent down to the camera to inform it, like here's all your settings, means you can put those things in there as well, and you can have completely different response to different scenes and, and have it all customized. And sort of get to get the shot that you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. Get the shot that you want, get, have the, pl the, well, I say player, user, uh, mm -hmm. get a, have a good experience and feel like they understand um, uh, kind of an, intu an intuitive level, like, oh, I, I can pinch in and out and, and you know swipe around and it'll track and things like that. And it can be a 
like just having a nice feel of that capacitive mm -hmm. touch and how it can can make the experience feel very um, much so, very much so. Rock it, solid, it's, yeah. Um, the be, being able to like just walk up and and rotate something mm -hmm. and look behind it is is extremely rewarding when it's a tactile. Response. And you're right. It's we're used to using our hands mm -hmm. every day, and that's why capacitive touch is, is such a common interface. That's yeah, why so, yeah. All I mean, <laughs> when, I, when I started doing this, that was not the case yeah. <laughs> 20 years ago. Uh, but yeah, I mean, everybody has tablets and phones now. Mm -hmm. Everybody's used to just... Yeah, and we're using a... Uh, this is just a, a monitor that has capacitive touch on yep. it as well. It, it's basically the same thing as a laptop screen. Yeah. Right? Uh, most of the more current laptop uh, displays have capacitive touch. So, let's see if I can... Yeah, I was trying to get the there. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, it's 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 a pretty simple common hardware. Um, this will work with a mobile project. Um, the the touch input will. Um, I haven't tried it on a current one in probably two years. Um, but if you the the input the the stack works exactly the same. Yep. Um, you might run into some different issues with if you have UMG and you're trying to build an exclusion zone or something like that. But um, our first um, car configurator kind of project that we we built to demo this, one of the things that we we did have was the ability to um, you know swipe through on an iPad and have it rendering on the screen. So we were taking the touch from here and just instead of passing it on the same machine, we were passing it over the network to. The same you did place. a live stream on that. That's the McLaren demo, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, there's a live stream on that. Yeah, but that, that's literally, it it's it's using this, the, uh -huh. the kind of first or second iteration of this uh, Orbit Blueprint and Touch Manager. It's just being fed by the touch results from an iPad. That's pretty cool. Yep, worked out quite well. Let's see. So, questions? Yeah, we have a couple here. Um, one of our viewers noted... Um, Asked us, notice touch can be a little slow in response. Is there a way to optimize to make it as responsive as possible? So there's two things. One, there's the frequency at which touch is passed down. Okay. Right? And, and that does change, and that's kind of why I have different sensitivity mm -hmm. options, is because some devices just pull quicker, like they send updates more frequently. Um, but a lot of that is actually due to the amount of filtering that I'm doing. To get that nice, smooth feel, I'm essentially accumulating five to ten samples of where your finger has okay. moved, averaging the results and then passing them in as the final. What that means is that you do get a sense of delay as you move your finger. Um, if you turn on like the direct rotation uh, flag that I have, mm -hmm. you get much less filtering and you can feel that it's way more responsive, but at the cost of, of it being over precise. Right. You, you start to lose that smoothness to the response curve. And so if you're experiencing that, it, it might be that the device itself is just yeah. not as responsive as you might want for the type of gameplay. Exactly. And, and sometimes it is performance related as well, right? Uh, low frame rate in your project doesn't necessarily affect the polling speed from the monitor. So you end up with more or less accumulation happening because there's been so long between frames and you'll get different responses. Mm -hmm. So um, we definitely notice under about... 30, 24 to 30 frames a second, if, if what you're doing is really complicated, you'll start to feel the difference in touch input below that. And that's both touch and as well how often we're updating the frames. Yeah, right? and so that, that, that's a lot more to do with just how often we're like com successfully completing a frame and pulling mm -hmm. the data and, and all my fil filtering is being applied. Let's see. Um, is the fading rotation that carries on after swiping based by the one on Studio's product viewer? No. The, uh, the momentum that's in the, the swipe is just something that I built into it. Essentially, I look to see which direction were you swiping last, and then I leave a tiny bit of, of um, like 0.02 value accumulating on that swipe. Okay. So it just says you swiped from left to right, so that's a positive value. We're going to never quite go down to zero. We're going to go down to 0.02, and then every uh, successful loop, we're just going to add that amount of mo motion to the camera. I see. And if you go swipe the other way, oh, you've flipped it, so now we're, we're accumulating negative two instead of positive two or whatever. And turning on drifting eliminates that part of the uh, blueprint. So you, you just come to rest instead. Let's see. <clears throat> They're wondering if... 
Will the final result of this demo be uploaded to the market with clear info regarding what hardware you can test this solution with? I don't think no, I don't, so. I don't no, think no we're going to take it to that no. extreme. No, it'll, so, it'll be like as is released with some cleanup. I will try and like lay out the the functions and stuff so that they're at least annotated. It, it's probably not going to have a ton of documentation, but there will at least be some clarity to the flow of things through it. What I usually suggest when you when you get a project like this, it's it's to break it down, mm -hmm. take the pieces that you need and understand yep. and and possibly implement them yourself in your mm -hmm. project because there's quite a bit to this and you There is. And and there's there are, there are pieces of it that aren't necessarily useful in many cases, right? Things that were put in for a, a single demonstration or things that Honestly, you turn it on once and it'll be the same in every single project. It could be reduced to non-parameterized, just an explicit value. Um, and if you have, like, multiple monitors works fantastic for this because mm -hmm. you can have, you know, one is your input and the other I'll have the blueprint up and I can actually see as I swipe where the values are accumulating, you know, w when I touch, where it's firing off. And, and that can be a huge benefit for figuring out the flow, especially with something that is as tactically rewarding as yeah. having a touch screen. Like, touching and seeing things light up as you touch, I mean, it's silly, but it's rewarding yeah. for the designer. Just, hey, look, it's it's doing stuff. But it also means that when you're going to track down, like, why doesn't it do this? I, I have tons of things that you can log and turn on because you know, that's just the nature of the beast. It's awesome. Maybe I tried, actually, to do blueprints using a touch screen once on, mm -hmm. a, on a Cintiq, and that was a little tricky. Yeah, I don't generally develop using touch. No. <laughs> touch is definitely the result, not the uh, not the input tool. But um, yeah, I have found that like you can do some small stuff if you're careful, but it's definitely not the same thing as like having a mouse and, and mm -hmm. keyboard and, and and navigating that way. But yeah, the the interface is not really designed. Not so much for the main editor. There's no. a lot of other things that are designed to be touch friendly. This is not one of the things that we're 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 focused on. Is is getting that that main editor page. To Maybe be. one day we'll have the Minority Report kind of yeah exactly editor <laughs> interface. I saw someone who made a um, you you could essentially make blueprints in VR, mm -hmm. and so you could actually grab a cable yeah, and yeah, hook it up to a node. And absolutely, I, I love seeing that kind of stuff. It's really impressive seeing how where people evolve interfaces, you know, taking it into a new space and seeing how you can make something that, you know, was mouse and keyboard and flat before, and then suddenly it's got structure and it's mm -hmm. three dimensional. You can even you know have physics and have the wires kind of dangle and stuff. It's it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, essentially make make the work just satisfying. Right? Yeah, and, and that's what I said. Like just having the the blueprint open and pulling it while you're. There is there is a satisfactory feeling of hey look I'm I can see the tool responding as I interact with it, and you just have a sense that you know what's going on you mm -hmm. can figure out like the what's what is actually executing through the blueprint a lot more easily that way. That's awesome, um, and so someone was wondering if these blueprints were available when you create a mobile project and they're not. This is completely custom. Does not yep. ship with the engine, and once it will be available, it will not be available. As part of the engine, it yeah, will be... Uh, or supported. It'll correct. Be, Here, this here's is how I did it. You're welcome to break it down. And, yep, and, and use it as a learning there. learning example. But again, like, like I said, the the input touch event that kind of everything circles around, the, the one that I filter and all that, that is available as part of the engine. It's You can use it for mobile. It'll, it'll work. You just might find that you need to do a lot more tuning on this kind of stuff mm -hmm. to get it to work cleanly with a mobile title because this is what, what it was built for. But the way that you are calculating the data that you're mm -hmm. receiving from a touch input. I'm That's doing, all. I'm doing absolutely nothing in there that is that is um, platform specific. Yeah. It is, here's an input touch event, I'm filtering it a whole bunch, and then I'm moving the camera around in this blueprint. And if, you can see there things, how the... Yep, if those things are on a mobile platform, it'll, it'll just return that value. See, um, since phones have pressure sensitivity levels, is this something that's also exposed in U4 touch options? Um, light not, touch. Not in the... the uh, interfaces that I'm using. Um, I think there are some events that, that pass that data in, but I, I didn't use any of them for this. Um, so you might be able to follow up on that. I'll have a look, actually, because that's... Um, I would be curious about that as well. Yeah. It's just there, like... There's m most of what we... We're, the data that I'm getting is, did a touch happen and where? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wasn't even looking for, like, length of touch or pressure or size of 
the the touch on screen and I mean I've seen plenty of debug in, info from other touch screens where a little touch is a small dot and a, a hard touch is literally it shows you the size of your fingerprint touching the thing that wasn't data that I needed to filter for this so I'm, I w didn't even go looking for it in in this context so so in mind we'll we'll try to take a look uh, let's see I think okay here's his few that's coming more, in. More come up. Well, yeah, yeah, more popping up. Um, this is touch device agnostic, correct? Yes. Uh, I give Gear VR touch panels. Uh, for Gear VR, I think that that touchpad does not actually take any... Is that any the one that's on the... Y yeah, I, that one. I don't know. I, and then they also released the controller, but that's only one finger. Yeah, as far as I know. depending on how that's exposed, if that's exposed as a controller, then you would have to change the input touch to be the input coming from that controller. Because the, the concept was like a gamepad or yep. a keyboard or a mouse as discrete objects that pass in data is there. Uh, the touch is just, you have a touch device hooked up and it's passing that data in. It's essentially the touch controller mm -hmm. passing in whatever data it, it gets. Mouse, keyboard, um, joystick, gamepad, those would just be separate input devices that you'd pull and probably just essentially go to the input touch and feed them in as well, yep. and you'd get that input stream. Uh, you might have to change a few things based on what values are being passed in and what ranges they're in. It's usually just in a 2D coordinate system across all of them. So. Yeah, but like the, the, the touch input stuff that I've got here, it non-platform specific, but it still expects like you touched here in XY coordinates on a screen, mm -hmm. not on a small device that, that expects you to do this or like this or anything. Um, I, I leverage the fact that most screens are going to be large enough that you can touch it in two separate spots that aren't immediately adjacent and pinch and move apart. That's not something you're going to be able to do on like a little. an Oculus or a Gear mm -hmm. uh, touch input device. Now you're wondering... Um, why not use the spring arm, which has built-in lag? Um, one, it didn't exist when I first started oh, wow. this, um, because I started building it a while ago. But also, I wanted explicit control over mm -hmm. everything, and because um, we weren't, we didn't want some of the features that the spring arm had at the time. So we wanted an extremely, especially because we had the the motion control, you know, the the Tango device that you pull mm -hmm. up and then pilot. It it needed to be divorced from that even further for that. That makes sense. And right, and you, since you're doing it all in blueprints, you also probably don't have full control over um, everything from the spring arm might not be exposed that you exactly. want to. And yeah. then you have to it, change it, a bunch of stuff it, before it, you. It even wasn't extra functionality that I had to um, reverse engineer and make sure that I was satisfying all the constraints of. Everything that's happening is happening because the touch input, the touch manager is sending these values mm -hmm. in. The orbit blueprint is handling that and explicitly deciding how to move the camera. Once once everything is kind of in that ecosystem, it becomes a little easier to go, okay, now I need to add this feature. Here's where it sits in. You know, I might need to modify the uh, the hierarchy of, of scene components so that we have another, like, kind of point of articulation, but that's, it's still, it's I'm not having to modify someone else's content or add something on top of another mm -hmm. um, kind of black box or, or closed feature that's like, okay, I've got a swimmer component that I need to on tick change value to make it work right, it was easier to just kind of roll it on my own. And that's a benefit. It's easier for everyone who uses Blueprints to... Um, mm -hmm. And to reverse engineer and, yeah. and leverage that and use it in any project you like. Okay, I think that was it for... Okay, we got one more question here. Um, with the camera setting you had for the touch input, can you center the camera on a character for a similar effect? Um, you can move the, you could attach the orbit blueprint to something mm -hmm. and then it would just move like normally. Um, so in this case, I, I literally just, you know, put the input, uh, the orbit blueprint in the center of the world. If I move it, you know, over here, that over point has been moved, so now it's not as easy to see. Um, but if I did that in real time, if I attach that to a player and move that, that would work. And if the player didn't move, the entire mm -hmm. orbit blueprint would follow. Yep. So. Just the same. Basically, you're dealing with a lot of relative positioning. Where is my origin and where am I in relationship to mm -hmm. that origin? If your origin is moving with the player, 
everything falls from that, right? I'm rel I'm at zero, zero, zero relative to the player no matter where he goes until I move my camera. Then I'm only off by that amount. I'm not off by that plus the players move 10,000 units away or whatever. Yeah, and that's because it's all done in relative space instead mm -hmm. of world space. Yep. Yep. And, and that's literally why I have that, that articulation hierarchy of components is so that everything is relative to its parent and I only have to worry about... Um, small numbers changing per component instead of ever accumulating larger values because you've got lots of world positions being uh, dealt with. Let's see. <clears throat> Someone asked, if I heard correctly, this specific project is partially inspired from the McLaren demo. And that's right. That was the first. It, it was used. It, yeah, the, the Orbit Blueprint and the Touch Manager were, were uh, used in the M McLaren demo, though in an earlier form than, than I've got them here. Uh, the tracking and panning didn't go in until Human Race. So the ability to, like, two fingers and move around, like, mm -hmm. e in the camera plane was added later. But again, that's another example of things you can do iteratively further down the line as you develop your, uh, your blueprint tools. All right. That's awesome. I think it's time for us to go ahead and announce the... Uh, or announce the theme and kick off the uh, 2019 Summer UE4 Sounds Jam. Sounds good. Yeah, and we'll... We'll get, you'll stay here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to sit here and, and, then we'll, and then admire we'll back. you, watch you work. All right, all right. And then ma maybe we'll get a couple more questions that we can sure. answer at the end as well. Absolutely. So if you have any more, feel free to drop them in. We'll, we'll stick with you for a little bit here. So to start off, I hope you all are excited. I know we are. The 2019 Summer U4 Jam is about to kick off. Actually, technically, it already did at 2 o'clock. You were allowed to even submit a project in the past hour. If you are already done that, that would be absolutely I, I, I don't have amazing because we haven't announced the theme yet, so yeah, yeah. that wouldn't really work. It's um, Orbit Blueprints. I win. <laughs> no, it's, it's not Orbit we're not, we're not allowed to, com to compete in that. I'm not allowed to win either. As Yeah, yeah that's how it works. Anyway, uh, first thing I wanted to announce, today is actually the first day that we were uh, able to announce the Falcon Northwest PC that will be our, our grand sweepstake winner prize among the winners. And to show you this off, we have this amazing graphic. Um, this is a 20th anniversary talent case that oh, Falcon Northwest is putting out. It is very, very cool. And we got some brand new custom graphics that um, the Falcon Northwest put together for us. Well, the graphics were made by us, but Falcon Northwest already uh, is the company who produces the Tiki and mm -hmm. all the other amazing boxes. And just to read off a little bit of the specs here, so you know what kind of a beast of a monster of a PC this is, it's an i9 5 gigahertz processor. It has a 280-millimeter um, sealed liquid cooler, 32 gigs of DDR4 memory, a cable mod custom cable package, GeForce RTX 2070 Super graphics card, which I guess they're just becoming available mm -hmm. now, which is really cool, a 1-terabyte Samsung uh, N NVMe storage drive, and a 750-watt EVGA power supply. So this is a... Beast. Yeah. <laughs> that I, is better than my home PC yep, by quite a bit. By quite a bit. I'd say almost twice on all the specifications of what I'm working on at home. So if you are one of the lucky ones who get this, I will be very, very, very jealous. Because not only that, but it looks absolutely amazing. Okay, and that was sort of my little little announcement in terms of the, anything else. You can actually go look at it on the itch.io page. It will be right there. And then before we announce the theme, I want to make sure that we go ahead and thank all of our sponsors because Falcon Northwest is far from the only one that is actually sponsoring the jam. And we have, as per usual, Side Effects and uh, Houdini are sponsoring with a one year indie license. Um, Intel Software is sponsoring a 480 gig gigabytes Intel Optane SSD, which is a super fast uh, solid state drive. Uh, a one year membership to the IGDA, which I'd like to let everyone know that the IGDA is. An amazing organization, and if you are part of, um, if you're a small studio or an indie, there are a lot of benefits you might not even know um, that they actually um, let you have. For example, like, uh, well, it matters to us here in the states, but you get health insurance through GDA, mm -hmm. um, which there's no other way to get that. It, you know, if you're self-employed, no, yeah, and it's definitely a, an incredible benefit. Yeah, um, and membership. Membership is relatively cheap as well, so I'd recommend that. Uh, Logitech is sponsoring with a G502 gaming mouse and a G512 mechanical keyboard. Uh, you get a full year subscription to Soundly Pro from Soundly, a uh, six month 8K freelancer subscription to Quixel Mega Scans, and the Marketplace team here is giving you $100, $100 in credit, which is really neat. 
uh, a six-month subscription to GameTextures.com, and then we have a whole slew of our marketplace creators. Uh, you should go ahead and check those out. I've listed them all out on the HIO page, but we got Decagon, Brainbox, Plan B Studios, Project Nature, uh, we got MoCap Online, Alexander Ivanov, and SB. So thank you all, all of your sponsors who are helping us make this jam um, something sort of exciting to work towards. Uh, and these were, were the prices for all of the finalists. Our special category winners will also go through most of these. They won't get any of the hardware options, but most of the software and the marketplace assets will be rewarded as prices. As always, we have the DX Racer sweepstake, which is um, you might be able to receive one of three Unreal Engine branded cool looking DX, DXR Racer chairs. We sit in those in the office. They are awesome. Um, you might be, see, this is uh, one out of 10 one month subscriptions to GameTextures.com. And then we're also continuing the sweepstake from last, uh, last jam where we had the Marketplace Takeover, which is uh, $50, so 20 $50 credits to the Unreal Engine Marketplace that will be handed out among everyone who participates in the jam. And so that's me listing out a bunch of stuff. And now I think it is time to go ahead and announce the theme. I, I, I think you're going to need to soon. Yep, yep. Greg, are you ready? Yep. Greg's ready. I'm ready. Let's do a drum roll. And the theme is make it count. Make it count. Make it count. <laughs> That's what you got to do. One, two, no, <laughs> not that kind of make it count. Well, that, well that, it, that it would, could be. It, it could, could be. be, yeah. yeah. And if this is one of your first jams and you're unfamiliar, this is not a literal representation of the theme. Right. In any way that you can think, I like how I was pointing at me. I am not I, a literal I, sorry, representation. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> the, the general we, the, the general me. Don't, don't no. make Alan count. No, actually, don't I, think, I, I don't need to count. I would say, considering what we've seen you work on here, and, and for yeah, I don't need to count. I don't want maths. No, leave leave, <laughs> leave maths alone. But you've been doing math for what? Like I am so bad at years? <laughs> Hey, really, newsflash, you it, can become a game developer and not be... Yeah, it's amazing how much the tools really do get yeah. you over the hump of not knowing the And just how you learn but, yeah. a formula and how to use the formula. Oh, yeah, I know all sorts of stuff about vector math that I never learned in, like, school that I just picked up through working with stuff and figuring out how, like, relative and world positioning mm -hmm. works and things like that. And it's great how you can visualize so much of the trigonometry yep. um, in a game engine. <clears throat> Absolutely. Our, all right, so that's the theme. I hope you all are just running off right now. If you don't, thanks for sticking around. Yeah, the stream just went to zero. <laughs> nobody, everybody has just left. <laughs> we, can ha we can have a quick look. Nope, there's, there's still some people here. Actually, most of them did tune in for the announcement. Oh, so. good, good. Yes, uh, I've seen Chatter. We did, the theme is right here, and we will leave it on the, on the monitor for the continuation of the stream, which won't be too much longer. Uh, Make it count is the theme for the 2019 Summer U4 Jam. Um, it will kick off. And just a couple of things I wanted to go over that um, we noticed last jam and I've noticed jams before. And I can't iterate these things enough, and so I will repeat them again, and I probably will for the foreseeable future. Package early. The first day, the first time you have anything that be con considered not even playable, just, just package your project. Make sure that no one added something to the project that won't make it compile, that will mm -hmm. cause you issues. You don't want to deal with those issues when you're an hour before submission deadline. When you've got all of your content and you've got God knows how much yep. thing, how many things it could be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Test early, test often. And especially if you're working on something that's mobile or a separate device like an Oculus Quest, you want to push and play on that device as soon as possible mm -hmm. and you want to do it early and throughout, throughout the, uh, the five days. Yep. I, I think I try to package at a game jam. I think I try to do a playtest every like five hours or something minimum. Also, it's it's nice to get other people in the team, especially if you're the the gameplay designer and you're implementing the logic for what buttons will do and everything else. Make sure that your team gets to play that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in editor, it might not be like, for example, if it is supposed to be played on a, on a phone or a Quest, the actual experience needs to be, you know, packaged and put on that device so that everyone can experience it and, and, and yeah, give you feedback. Don't rely on your assumptions. Just because you think you understand how something should be implemented and played with doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree. And having that, uh, that those sanity checks and, and other people's eyes on it can be yeah, critically Yeah, just, just put it in someone else's hands, you know, mm -hmm. or in their face, depending on... What, what if it is a VR thing, don't just, you know put things in people's faces. I would say especially. No well, that, yeah. That's a bad thing, but Look. definitely have people play test it when it's VR. Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the, after doing thousands of, the, I, I, several yeah. thousands of, of VR demos, I yep. cannot tell VR. you how many times I've been like, oh, this is intuitive and easy, yep. and a professional game developer steps in and has no idea what to do. And you're yep. like, oh, 
yeah, I assume that because that made sense to me when I designed it. Well, VR is such a subjective environment to be in. Everybody has different assumptions about how things will work that, yeah, if, if you put it in somebody's hands and they just don't think the way you do, that's an important thing to know. Yeah, and it can be really hard to teach things mm -hmm. in VR. So one of the design... Yeah, all it takes is somebody not looking at the thing that you yeah. thought everybody was going to see and they miss critical information. And finding things like that out early is critically important. Yeah, and... and Make sure you design around that. Something that I usually say is try to design it as if it would be a real-world interaction. Because mm -hmm. you usually don't have to tell anyone how to open a door. Right. That's not an instruction. Or to pitch a, push a big red button. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of natural. Um, stepping away from some life lessons out of VR development, I think the next thing that I want to mention is when you submit to itch, there is you submit to your, you, you upload a game to your profile. That's the first step. Once you've done that, that's actually the point when you can go ahead and submit it as a game to the jam. And I would suggest you do this not like r last minute when you're done with the jam and you're done with the build and you got an hour left. You can do this on Sunday already, mm -hmm. you know, a day or two before the jam. And that gives you time to gather everyone's information because in that submission form, you're going to want to go ahead and enter uh, the email addresses for everyone on your mm -hmm. team, the name of your team. You have to make sure that you list all of the sourced assets that you were using. Um, without that, we can actually disqualify you if you are putting in assets that weren't created during the jam. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to make sure that all of that is in there. Now, you can go ahead and update that information afterwards until the deadline, until the jam right. is over. And so if you go ahead and go through the submission process, make sure that all that works, maybe even try to download and play it just to make sure that you know, that entire process works, um, that's, that's really good. It might even be cool if you're looking for, I, I saw a couple of sort of project manager, uh, producer ask people mm -hmm. wanting to join your team. It's amazing to have someone on the team during a jam who's just keeping an eye on yep. things. Do, do, basically, the administrative work, you don't have time to do yourself. Yep. No, you don't, because yep. you're the only gameplay designer or the only artist who's mm -hmm. supposed and, to make... And, and you have a completely subjective idea of how long things are going to take that nobody else has the same subjective idea. Yep. Having that person to coordinate things is invaluable. The producers can sit and say, you told me this would take 20 minutes. It's now three hours later, mm -hmm. and we've yet to finish You know, another really important... Or even just the... X number of people are waiting for you to get this done so they can be productive. Knowing that and having someone coordinating all of that is, is absolutely Yep, and that's critical. why that is a very important role. Mm -hmm. and and we we don't have producers for fun. We have producers because we need producers. Yep, and we have a lot of them. And we generally need more. Yeah, almost always. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, any other Game Jam life lessons that we can share? Uh, not off the top of my head. I, I get in game jam, involved in Game Jams pretty infrequently. But. Well, uh, a lot of your days can probably seem a little bit like a game jam, though. There's something to be said for working on smaller projects mm -hmm. with a short deadline. Yeah, there's definitely a, a sensation of get it done, get it out, and move on to the next thing, which is a lot similar to what you do in a game jam. Yep. So, yep. And it can be a good you know, experience. Of sort of, mm -hmm. It's like a short life cycle of a, yeah, a project. Yeah, and, and you definitely get a sense of what you, what's worth spending your time on. Mm -hmm. right? if, if you have a week-long project and it doesn't get done because you spend all your time working on you know, uh, the UI, then it's probably not the kind of thing you should spend a lot of your time on the next time. You should figure out a faster way of doing that so you can move on to things that are more productive. I've also seen projects where they made one mechanic that was really quick to implement mm -hmm. and it felt good, and then they just polished the entire game around that. Mm -hmm. So they had a nice menu, you know, mm -hmm. menu screen, and there was a nice end slate, and yep. all of these cool things that just made the whole experience. Um, well, knowing what you want to present the player is incredibly important. Just going through and going, okay, I have an idea of how I want the player to play the game and focusing on that to the exclusion of wouldn't it be cool if mm -hmm. things, like adding something just because you had a cool idea of that you could add, that's great. That's, that's the kind of thing you might want to do after the game jam. But in terms of getting it done, getting it polished, and getting it playable, those are pretty high priority things that you want to focus on early and, and think about them constantly throughout the development. All right, and then there's one thing I want to make sure to mention. This is your last chance for signing up for uh, Assembla. Assembla is a um, cloud provider that and that that are sponsoring the jam. Maybe, maybe I didn't even mention that earlier. Ooh, better me. Um, use any form of source control for the jam. It doesn't matter if that is just a another hard drive you got laying around, um, you know, a thumbstick. 
back your project up mm -hmm. as often. If, if you're not comfortable with the workflow using source control, then at least make sure that you have, have it backed up somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are interested in sort of the way that we actually work on projects most of the time, we are using source control. Assembla for the Jam is providing spaces where you can use Parforce, Git, SVN, and you, you can actually set up a source control uh, environment mm -hmm. on the cloud, and you can share that with all, all the members of your team. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is super cool, and you can go ahead and go to our workflow. We are prepared uh, to get to assemble some some documentation, exact specifically for how to set up Perforce, SVN, etc. All of that is linked on the HIO page. You can go ahead and find that. And today is the last chance to sign up. After today, we will actually shut them down, um, or, or the sign up form will go down. So make sure that you go ahead and do that today, so that we can set up the space for you. All right, I think I think that might be it for today. Um, thank you, Alan, for coming by, showing some of this stuff up. Um, I'll make sure to update. We'll, we'll stay in touch, mm -hmm. and I'll yep. make sure to let everyone know on the announcement fo post of the of, of this live stream when the project is available okay. for download. Um, and we'll go ahead and make sure that get out there. I'm actually also gonna <laughs> go ahead and take well, a look at it, break you, it down. You, you have access. You can just ask me questions I, if, if you want. I guess I, that's fair. Everybody else doesn't, so I, I need to spend a couple days cleaning things up. But yeah. yeah, it'll no. be ready. But fairly soon. That sounds awesome. Okay, I think with that said, uh, oh, make sure that if, you, if you're streaming the jam, make sure you add the Unreal Engine category so that, so that we can jump on and, uh, and watch your work this week. And I did that last jam and it was a lot of fun. Also make sure to um, hit up your online community if you have any questions. The Game Jam channel on our uh, Unreal Slackers Discord or the unofficial uh, UE4 community Discord is very helpful throughout the jam. I see plenty of people asking questions, and there's there's a lot of good conversations there. So join UnrealSackers.org if you haven't already, and if you have some questions. Also, if you're looking for someone to work with still, that's another good place that you can reach out mm -hmm. and try to find some people. Um, as always, follow us on special media, and thanks to all of our sponsors, all of you, and good luck with the jam. I hope to see some amazing things by the beginning of next week. Tuesday is when it ends, actually. So until next Thursday. And remember, make it count. Make it count. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone.